Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Kathy Heakin, and I am recovering one day at a time in the Worldwide Fellowship of the Al-Anon uh, Family Groups. Hi. It's really nice to be here. Um, I'd like to thank Joe for calling me uh, and inviting me down. A lot of times I just can't speak in the summer for one reason or another, and I was getting ready to say, no, I don't think I can do it, but I don't know what he said, but whatever he said, I ended up saying, Sure, I think I can do it. I, I don't know how that happened, but I'm so glad it did. Um, and I'd like to thank Ellie for being in touch with me uh, throughout the year, um, you know, making sure that um, I was doing my part, which was to um, get an airline ticket and all those detailed things I'm not very good about. And a special thanks to Peggy, who picked me up at the airport and uh, has really shown me an awful lot of Florida hospitality. So <clears throat> I thank them particularly, and in general, I'd like to thank all of you um, for being here at this convention and for all the work that I know goes on in putting together for the 47th time a state convention. Um, like Ellie, I appreciate, uh, whenever I'm in an AA convention, I appreciate um, that spirit of cooperation that I often find, and usually always find, with uh, Al-Anon. Um, <clears throat> it has really been just a spectacular place. I can't imagine um, ever going to another convention that's quite this posh, uh, to tell you the truth. I was thinking it certainly makes up for all those times that uh, I found myself uh, in a tent, you know, a, <laughs> trying to keep the mosquitoes at bay. But being Irish Catholic, I know there will be a price for my being... <laughs> Oh, there'll be some suffering down the road for this. <clears throat> anyway, um, <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> I've enjoyed the workshops. I've certainly enjoyed the speakers. And uh, really, I come to you today filled with gratitude for being here. I am so very glad that I found you because for a long, long time I looked for you. Um, and I, I just didn't know where you were. I'd been to so many priests and um, social workers and psychologists and just trying to find out what was going on. I can remember one time I went to a social worker and I, I was always just so ready to try to tell somebody what I was living with. And she said to me, well, tell me about your family. I was like, my family? What does my family have to do with this? So <clears throat> I said, well, you know, in my family, we just laughed about everything. I mean, we never really took anything very seriously. And she said, well, that's pretty sick. <laughs> and I remember thinking at the time, well, maybe it is, but I loved being there. And that's the truth. I loved growing up in my family. I was third out of six kids, which really, in my neighborhood, six kids, we were like pikers. I mean, you know, my friends were one of eight. My sponsor is the oldest of 11. I mean, I'm used to these really large families. But we had six, and I was number three, and, and loved it. I, I just couldn't have thought of a better home in which to live. Now, it is true, I think, that even though, um, well, my parents drank, but nobody, it was never really a problem. As a matter of fact, nobody in my family to this day really trusts people who don't drink. Uh, <clears throat> but we didn't have, you know, there, alcohol was not a, a problem. But in my large extended family, there are always stories of people who drank a lot. And they were always told with a great deal of humor. My Uncle Mike, who came over with my, my grandmother from the old country, uh, he, was, he was a drinker and he carried a bottle in his back pocket. And one day when he was coming up our steps, he slipped on the ice and fell backwards. And he felt this liquid in the back of his pants and he's touching all around and he goes, oh, thank God it's blood. <laughs> I mean, we told that story in my family forever. Stories like that, you know? <clears throat> Funny stories. 
Mrs. Pendergast came over uh, with, my, with my grandmother on the very same boat, and she was always distressed about her husband, who would hit the bars after work and would come home late. So one day she decided to find uh, a pint, and just before he arrived home late at night, she dumped most of it uh, down the sink, and then she sprinkled the rest of it all over herself. And when, she, when he walked in, there she was just laying there with this empty pint in one hand, just reeking of alcohol, and Mr. Pendergast never drank again. And see, that was the kind of thing that I was always trying to come up with. I remember those stories, and I would always think to myself, when alcohol became an issue in my life, wow, if I could only come up with a scenario, if I could only come up with the right words, with the right thing to do, I too will be able to cure this thing. So all those Sunnies were, uh, stories were pretty funny, except when the stories I heard about my own grandfather. Those stories weren't very funny. And my mother wouldn't talk about it very often, but I remember once I was in Al-Anon saying to her, Mom, do you think your father was an alcoholic? Oh! She looked at me and she said, of course he wasn't an alcoholic. We didn't have enough money for him to be an alcoholic. <laughs> he was just a mean Irish drunk. And, and that's the way, you know, that's the way they looked at that. That's the way that they looked at that. Um, <clears throat> I've heard two remarkable stories this weekend from uh, sisters, which are very close uh, to, to me because... Uh, growing up, I've had 16 years, over 16 years of an education with nuns. And, um, and I had very good women who taught me. But <clears throat> what I remember most about that education was <clears throat> the importance of doing good and of getting good. The importance of doing good and of getting good. The importance of always doing for others, of being of service, of being self-sacrificing, that's what I heard, the value of suffering. I mean, I was, well, you must have gone to school where I went. <laughs> I mean, the value of suffering. But <clears throat> it had to be, the key was, it had to be silent suffering. Because if you complained about it, it didn't count. It just didn't count. I was thinking just this afternoon, I can remember, because I grew up, I was a little kid when they, all that communist scare was going on, and I can remember my, my, the nun who, had, who taught me that year telling me that if the communists ever came to Cincinnati, that they would take all the nuns and they would hang them in Fountain Square. And I have never forgotten that image. Every time I go downtown to Cincinnati and I see Fountain Square, I have that image in the back of my head of all those nuns, you know, hanging by a lamppost. I mean, that's a terrible thing. But what I also remember when she told that story, she told it with a certain amount of relish, <laughs> is that that might be a good thing that might happen to her. So... <clears throat> I don't know if I was primed for, for, for what would follow, but I certainly had that sense, that, you know, that idea of the importance of hanging in there, of doing good, of getting good, of looking good, of looking good. Um, <clears throat> the other important thing in my family, of course, was the humor. I mean, we were raised to, to look at things with a, with a great deal of humor. I know uh, I tell this story very often, but really it was true in my family. Everything that happened was met with humor. I mean, that's how my, my parents taught us to deal with life. They also taught us that life was difficult, that life was earnest, life was hard. My mother would say that. Life is earnest, life is hard. But for them, to, from my perspective, it always seemed like it was going along quite well because they were so funny. When my father's only brother died at age 48, and he, like a true Irishman, he never married, he'd lived with his mother. He died at 48 of a sudden heart attack. And he had been uh, the president of the Hibernians. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Hibernians, um, but it's just this little Irish group that, uh, I mean, I'm sure there's more than that to it. But they dress up and they have this little organization and they organize the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Cincinnati. They kidnap the statue of St. Patrick's, and then it appears March 17th at the head of the parade. And it's a lot of regalia and a lot of tradition. He was um, president of the Hibernians. So when he died suddenly, the Hibernians took over the planning of his wake and of his funeral. And I can remember my father standing alongside the casket, the open casket of his only brother, 
And I went up to him, and I put my arm on my father's shoulder, and I said, gosh, Dad, the Hibernians have done such a wonderful job with this wake and with the funeral tomorrow. And my father looked at me, and he said, this is nothing. Tomorrow they're going to execute a Protestant. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, see, that's the kind of smart aleck humor that was always going on in my family. Always going on in my family. And yet my family has, has really known. They've known a lot of tragedy. They truly have. But we just never, we don't... Um, <laughs> When I was growing up, I'm, I'm quite frankly, I'm raised by parents who went through the Depression and World War II, and nobody paid a bit of attention to my inner child when I was growing up. <laughs> nobody asked me how I felt about things. Nobody asked me if my feelings had been hurt. I mean, we just, <laughs> self-pity? I don't think so. Not where I lived. I mean, we just wasn't permitted. We just wasn't permitted. You weren't allowed to feel sorry for yourself. And if you did, my mother would just resp always respond, as she does to this day, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. Oh, it'll, it'll work out. It'll work out. She always says that. There is a firm belief uh, where I came from that no matter what it looks like today, things will work out. And if they don't, then pretend like they did. <laughs> <clears throat> I have a brother, John, who in a horrible accident when he was 21 years old lost his entire arm and his entire leg. I mean, he is literally half gone. What a funny kid. What a funny kid he is. I mean, he, 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 that accident happened in July, in October. I mean, he's at the Halloween party, and, you know, he's, of course, you know, Captain Hook. I mean, he just, I mean, there's just no feeling, no wallowing in self-pity allowed. It's just not permitted. Uh, not so long ago, I've told this story before, but not so long ago, he has a prosthetic leg, and he has to work on a... Oh, on a treadmill to keep his weight constant so that that leg and the arm, but particularly the leg, will continue to fit. So he was walking on this treadmill one Saturday morning, and I wasn't paying attention. He fell off the treadmill, and it was just a mess. So he went upstairs and called his prosthetic guy, and he said, Bill, uh, it's John. I've, I've got to see you today. And Bill said, oh, sorry, John. I'm having a bad day. I don't think I can see you. John said, Really? Well, I just duct taped my foot to my leg. What's going on with you? <laughs> so. <clears throat> it's a funny family. It's not normal, but it's a funny family. <clears throat> and I like it that way. Um, <clears throat> I will say this, that <clears throat> the teaching that I had, really had a big impact on me. You know, that idea of, of being good, of getting good, of looking good, had a huge impact on me. But <clears throat> I always was fascinated and attracted by those who really didn't care about getting good or being good or looking good. I was always attracted to people who broke the rules, who, who clearly, I mean, when the sign says, don't park, it's a fire lane, there they were, parked right in the middle of the fire lane, you know? who just weren't always so concerned as I was about your feelings and, and, oh, you know, filtering everything that I said because I certainly didn't want to step on your toes. I used to think that I was addicted to, to, to being good. I think my addiction is uh, to approval, to approval. It was strictly always trying to be good and to do good. It was an addiction to approval. But when I met my husband, I was fixed up with him by one of uh, his sisters, I thought that he was poss possibly the bravest man that I had ever met in my life because he didn't care what he said to you, and he didn't care what it looked like. He did what he wanted to do. And at the time when I met him, he was in flight school with the United States Marine Corps. And that, for a cowardly person like me, was pretty attractive. He used to, when he would walk up the steps to my house, he never really walked up the steps. He more or less swaggered up the steps. And the first date we had, he arrived with a silver monogrammed cup that was filled with bourbon. Oh, I just thought that was so neat. I 
thought that was so sophisticated. He just seemed to have absolutely no fears whatsoever. And I really liked that. I really liked that. I thought that he would be the kind of guy that would do for me what I could never do for myself. <clears throat> One time, <clears throat> when we had a date, we had friends in Batesville, Indiana, who owned horses. And his father used to raise quarter horses, so he knew all about horses. He knew a lot, it seemed to me, about a lot of things. But <clears throat> So we went over to Batesville, Indiana, to ride horses with a gang of friends, and um, one of the guys got into a little stall that was much too small, and he was with a horse that was much too powerful, and he really didn't know what he was doing. He was in trouble. So he, there he was with this saddle, and, and this horse had him cornered, and the, and the call went out, get Rick, get Rick, get Rick. Well, I'm with Rick. That makes me feel pretty good, because I know I'm with the guy that's going to be able to take care of this crisis. And sure enough, Rick bounds into, this, into that little small space, that small stall with his powerful horse, and he reaches up around that horse's neck and grabs its ear and bites it as <laughs> hard as he can, which will paralyze a horse, as it would paralyze me. And he then threw the saddle on that horse, and all was well, and I thought to myself, well, there's the guy I want to spend the rest of my life with. <laughs> I mean... What can't he do? What can't he do? And so <clears throat> we decided to get married, and, and that decision was made pretty quickly, actually. I didn't even know it had been made before he announced it, but <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I figured that we would. I just didn't know that we were going to get married that quickly or that he was going to say something because we hadn't really discussed it. But you see, that seems crazy to me today, but I was always the kind of person that was willing to let you make my decisions. Because, yeah, go ahead. Where do you want to go for dinner? I don't care. You pick. Because if you pick the lousiest restaurant, it's not my fault. You picked it. <laughs> and I had a habit of doing that. It appeared on the outside as being, you know, just laid back. Hey, whatever you want. But in reality, what it was, was in a reluctance to take responsibility for decisions that I made. And I have found, since I've been in this program, that has been a huge thing. That has been a huge thing, that reluctance to make a decision for no other reason than unwilling to live with the consequences, unwilling to live with the consequences. It's a cowardly way to operate. I didn't know that at the time. It seemed to me to be a very, very wise way to operate. But here we are. He makes this announcement we're going to get married. He had orders to go to Vietnam. He just wasn't sure when that was going to happen. So we married very, very quickly. We mar we've married quickly, and he was sent to um, Cherry Point, North Carolina, Marine Corps Air Station. And we were not married more than 10 days when I knew that I was in over my head. 10 days, and I knew that I was in trouble. And I could not tell you what it was, because at that time, the drinking was not really anything that I was paying close attention to, because he was a Marine. And we were always with marine pilots, and a lot of them were drinking. And I thought it had to do with the fact that they were being sent to Vietnam. But one thing that I did notice was his drinking was always different. His drinking was frightening to me. And so what I did was, was I took all those fears and all that bewilderment, and I just pretended like everything was okay, because I didn't know what else to do. I just didn't know what else to do. I knew I couldn't go home 10 days after I was married. I knew that would not look good. And so <clears throat> I thought what I was doing was adjusting to marriage, but what I was really doing from the very beginning was I was trying to adjust to the disease of alcoholism, and there is no sane way to do it. There was no sane way for me to do it. My kids today like to say, and there she was, waiting for the clue bus without a ticket. <laughs> really, I, I, I didn't know what was going on. All I knew is that I was always afraid, I was always filled with anxiety, and I was always bewildered. I was always bewildered. I was always asking myself, what is he going to do next? What will, he, what will he say next? 
What will he do if, 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 if you know, what will, what will he do if he finds this out? And so early on, I became very, very secretive. I was always trying to keep things from him because I was also always so fearful of his reaction. I mean, we would go to these squadron parties, and it became clear to me that I had to be attentive. I had to pay attention. I had to pay attention to how much he was drinking, not because I cared so much, but because it would determine how I could be. The more he drank, whew, the quieter I became. I was smart. I learned to lay low, and I wasn't, whew, I never nagged. I love when I go to meetings and I hear women saying, I nagged and nagged and nagged. Oh, I never would have nagged. It would have been dangerous. I just kept my mouth closed. But I learned to stay a little bit behind him so I could warn you, because you were my responsibility, you see. So <clears throat> I would stay behind him, and if you would bring up a topic that I knew would be volatile, I would, I would try to engage you with this eye contact. I would try to go. <laughs> oh, my God. I was so worried that he would offend you. I, would so, I was so worried. But in reality, I was so worried about what would you think of me? What would you think of me? as a woman, as a wife, that could not control her husband. Because the truth of the matter was, I always believed that once we were married, he would be different. <laughs> and, that's the, and that's honest. I always believed that once we were married, he would be different. And in our literature, it says, quotes Thomas Merton, that the beginning of love is to allow those we love to be themselves perfectly. And I had no idea how to do that. I was always trying to make things look good and make it look like my life was exactly the way I wanted it to be. I never considered not getting into a car with him when he would drink. How would that look? I would never consider asking you for a ride home. I thought the smartest thing to do was to get a seatbelt on, carry a rosary in my pocket, and keep my mouth shut. That's what I thought a loyal wife did. And when my husband finally got his orders to go to Vietnam, I was absolutely, from the bottom of my heart, relieved. And I knew I was the only woman in that entire squadron who felt that way. I also knew <clears throat> that it was probably politically incorrect to have those feelings. So I would wring my hands and I would just join in, you know, all of that that was going on. And what should we do? Should we stay here in Havelock, North Carolina? Should we go home? What should we do? I couldn't wait to go home. I just wanted to go home. And I couldn't wait for them to leave. I mean, I know I was the only one that was watching her little calendar thinking, when are they going to pull the squadron out? I'd only been married four months. I'd only been married four months. So off they went to Vietnam. I made a beeline back to Cincinnati. And I'll tell you, I just believed that I would get this year where I'd be able to figure it out. I got home, and I called that priest that had married us. And as I was walking out the front door, my mother said to me, I hope you're not going to tell him anything personal. <laughs> oh, no. I didn't know what to tell him. I didn't know what to tell him because I didn't know what the problem was. And sometimes when I hear people say, oh, you know, I've never got any help. Well, for me, I never told anybody really what was going on. I was even protective about people that I spoke to. I felt like there would be this great disloyalty in talking about really what was going on. I just was hoping they'd be able to figure it out from the few clues I threw their way. So this priest tells me I come from this long line of aggressive women and I probably needed to take a back seat and everything would be all right. But you know, <clears throat> I, knew that wasn't, I knew that wasn't it. And that's why the relief that I felt when I finally felt Al-Anon was there because it was the first time when I came to that beginner's meeting that I had a sense that I was where I was supposed to be, that I had a sense that that's where the answers were because I had been to a lot of different places, and I would always leave with heart sick, thinking, I don't know what it is, but that's not it. I'd go to psychologists, speak in I statements. Oh, my God, I'd come home and say, I hate you. <laughs> that didn't work. 
So, you know, it's just that confusing, that, that confusion, that bewilderment. We talk about, you know, our, our thinking becomes confused and our perceptions distorted. That's what happened to me from the early months of my marriage. That's what happened to me. Um, people would say to me, are you worried that your husband will be hurt while he's in Vietnam? <clears throat> And, you know, I wasn't because my husband was so very, very good at, at everything he did. Always he did well. He was an excellent jet pilot. Excellent. When I would watch him pr do those practice runs, you know, they have to come down and try to hit that middle wire. You know, there's a middle line on the, on the practice field, and they try to hit that middle line, which stands for the middle wire. He always hit that middle wire. Always hit that middle wire. So I knew he was a good pilot, but the real reason that I didn't think they'd shoot him down was because he was just so daggone mean, you know? It's always those nice little boys from Indiana they were shooting down, you know? But I used to think to myself, maybe if they'd just catch him and torture him a little bit, <laughs> he would straighten him out. Now I'm a bride, you know? I'm a bride. What the heck kind of thinking is that for me, this nice little Catholic girl? But here I am, and I'm thinking of these things, and I know that's wrong. And then I begin to feel even worse about everything. And needless to say, I didn't figure anything out. He came back from Vietnam, decided when he got out of the service to become a dentist. I don't know how that happened, but <clears throat> we went up to Ohio State, and he spent three years in dental school at Ohio State. At the time, they put it all in three years. But shortly before we left for Columbus, he... Uh, had been out drinking over in Newport, Kentucky, and was beaten badly by a bouncer. He had to have surgery on his, actually on his eye, uh, um, before he could go to school because he couldn't really see well out of that eye the way the bouncer had left it. So those three years when we were in Columbus, he didn't drink at all. And I thought it was because I had been patient, long-suffering, hadn't nagged, hung in there, kept it to myself, been silent. You know, I, we, well, I've heard this prayer in Al-Anon for years now, God, sit on my tongue. You know? <laughs> God, sit on my tongue. I didn't know that prayer then, but it was as though, you know, I had done something in those early years of marriage not to, you know, not to go berserk. And now, look. Now he's in dental school, he's getting these great grades, all seems to be well. We're in this little marriage group in our parish, you know, we're giving talks about marriage. Oh, I mean, <laughs> schoolings are going great. Out of dental school, back to Cincinnati, and everything is crazy again. I can't see any alcohol, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I don't know what's going on, but I know something's wrong. So what I do, you see, is this. I always have to be a little bit crazier than he is because I got to see it coming. It's very important for me to see it coming. So I wait. I wait to see what's coming in the door so I know what to do and how to be. If he's coming in the door and he's in a bad mood, I get quiet. If he's coming in the door and he's in a good mood, ah. I take advantage of that. I get in a good mood because I don't want to lose those moments. So without really realizing it, everything is about him and his moods and where, you know, and what he's doing. And I'm making myself crazy with this, but I'm trying to pretend like everything's great. Eventually, he wrote me a letter. He handed it to me. I was standing in the kitchen of our home. It wasn't really our home. It was uh, his parents' home. We were renting it. Uh, <clears throat> hands me this little letter and it says, Dear Kathy, I'm going to be arrested very shortly <laughs> by the narcotic unit of Cincinnati. He'd been writing himself prescription drugs. You know, as a dentist, you can do that and had been just taking drugs left and right. Well, <clears throat> I was so relieved when I read that little letter. <laughs> I think to myself, holy mother of God, thank you, he's only a drug addict. Oh, I, I thought he was crazy. Oh, this is such good news. <clears throat> because, you see, I thought now that they take his license away, which they did, 
um, what would happen then is that he could no longer get a hold of those narcotics, and we could just go back to those three little years that we had at Ohio State University, that it would just be okay. Because, you see, I didn't know. I didn't know the nature of the disease. I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know at that time that it was a family disease. I didn't know that when alcoholism came to our house, it came not only for my husband, it came for me and for all of us. It came for all of us. We were all profoundly affected and are profoundly affected by the disease of alcoholism. But I didn't know that until I found you. And so I did my best then to try to make, you know, to try to make things okay constantly trying to make the rough road smooth. I knew that he was on edge, and so I tried to do everything that I could to control the circumstances. Tried to make sure kids didn't spill milk on the table. Tried to make sure that, you know, my friends didn't call me too much, and when I was on the phone, I didn't laugh too loudly. Always trying to control the circumstances because I never knew when he was going to go off. I just never knew when he was going to go off. Because if you take the alcohol and you take the drugs away from my husband, it was really like living with a caged tiger. And it was dangerous. It was dangerous. And so the fear that I once felt had returned, and it had increased. It just simply had increased. Now, <clears throat> once they took my husband's license uh, to practice dentistry, uh, what happened then for me was this. See, I grew up in what I call the shadow of the potato famine. Everybody in my family is convinced that no matter how much money you have today, next week it can all be gone. <laughs> and probably will be if you have too much. So <clears throat> now we're, we're faced with, you know, unemployment. I mean, there's no income coming in, and we're living in this house that's owned by his parents, and we live on this family compound. Um, his parents lived in the main house. He had brothers and sisters that lived, you know, in various houses, and he also came from a big family. And we're living in this little side house. It was the summer house, but it was this lovely house, really. It had a pool on the side. It overlooked the hills of Kentucky and the Ohio River. There was a tennis court and a stables with these quarter horses and this long, winding driveway, split rail fences. I mean, if you had come to visit me, you would have thought, wow. She has everything. But the fact of the matter was, I had nothing. We had no income. We had, no, we, we, had, we had all these kids. My husband had a friend that knew how to run the scam on the welfare, um, uh, the welfare office, and we were getting this you know, generic cheese, and we were drinking powdered milk. And I mean, it was insane. And the only income was coming, that was coming in was the fact that when my husband was thrown out of dentistry, he, decided to become a fox hunter. Now, <clears throat> yeah, that was difficult for me to make that look good. <laughs> but I did. I did. My father, when I was a little kid, used to say, you ought to go into public relations. And I, and, and you know, I, really, perhaps I should have, because you know, fur trapping at one time was a very lucrative profession. You don't make a lot of money in the 1980s, but, you know, he would just go out with his guns. I mean, it was always guns. He would go out with those big guns and go off into the woods somewhere, and he would be gone for a long time. And, uh, and I don't know what he was doing in those woods, but I know when he would come back, he would have some fox, and he would just hang them up and then go up in the bed and usually sleep or pass out or whatever with the gun next to him. And the, my little kids would come home from school and they'd be like, oh my God, you know, all these dead fox hanging up by their feet. And, and eventually he would skin them, which was even more horrifying, really, if you've ever seen a skinned fox. It's just, and then he would sell these furs. So we would always have just a little bit. But I used to say to people, people would say, why isn't he practicing dentistry anymore? And I would say, you know, <clears throat> Dentistry really is far too boring a profession for him. <laughs> He's really much more of a Renaissance man. He likes fur trapping. And then I would make it sound like it was just the most interesting thing you could imagine. And my children would say, Mom, what do we put down on these when we would, they would start school? would always say, parents' occupation, what do we put down here? I would say, oh, put down independent businessman. I mean, I was always making it sound like it was great. But it wasn't, and I, I just didn't know what I was going to do.
I just didn't know what I was could do. Could. I always felt like I was on the edge of losing it. And I will tell you this. <clears throat> I have been taught my whole life to pray. I have been taught my whole life that when I was created, that God whispered in my ear, I want you to be happy, joyous, and free. I have been taught that by, a one, by wonderful people in my life. But I looked at where I was, and I could not imagine how the God of my understanding would want this for anyone. And I would go out at night on that hill overlooking the hills of Kentucky and the Ohio River, and I would look up to the heavens, and I would say, All right, God, maybe that wonderful childhood that I was gifted is going to be balanced out by an awful adulthood. But you cannot want this for my children. You cannot want this for my children. So I was always bewildered. I always felt like, all right, I'll put up with this. But these kids, these innocent little kids, because at the time where we lived, you know, there's these encroaching suburbs that are being built around. And I know that happens in a lot of rural areas. And so these people were, were building homes and moving in with their families who were not very much like the families on the compound. But <clears throat> they wouldn't let their kids come up to our house to play because of the steel leg hold traps that were around our house. <laughs> I used to call them the Stepford Wives. You know, I'd say, well, why are the Stepford Wives moved to the country if they are afraid of a little leg hold trap? If their little kids step in one, you just pull it open and pull the kid's leg out. And <laughs> And I'm always minimizing all these things, you know, or they didn't, you know, there's a lot of guns. My husband, uh, I know from his years in the Marine, he was just so talented. Marksman that he was, he would just lay in bed with that gun leaning up against the bed and uh, sleep with the window open because there was this huge oak tree outside of our bedroom window. And God forbid if the bad birds landed in that tree, you know, and he was awake, he'd reach back and get that gun and... You know, I'd race out and say to the kids, don't play on this side of the house today with your friends. Move to the other side of the house. Dad's hunting. And I mean, just like it was the most responsible thing I could do. You know, just keep them out of the, the range of fire. And It's just insane. I mean, and, and, and what happens to me, you see, is that I'm beginning to, ad I have to begin to adopt almost this way of thinking, you know, that there are these group of bad birds, you know, that have to die. And there are the good birds. The goldfinches could live. The blue jays, I'm sorry. You know, they're the criminal element of the bird world. And I'm thinking this way, but now I got the Stepford wives calling me because they don't know where their little house cats are. You know, and in our world, you see, Ronnie, skinny cats can live because they're out there hunting the quail and the pheasant to stay alive. But fat cats who are fed at home, they've got to go. <laughs> so, you know, I'm taking these phone calls. I'm like, well, I don't know where Boots is. Uh, if I see her, I'll be sure and bring her back. And I don't really, I just have a sick feeling that Boots isn't around anymore, so, uh, especially when he got the infrared glasses that allowed him. <clears throat> so, I'm on the phone constantly with family, with friends, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, trying to figure out what to do with Natty Bumpo. I mean, I'm like, you know, what are we going to do here? What do we, you know, constantly. And what I did is what I knew to do. I made fun of him. I mean, I just would tell all these outrageous stories. I'd go play cards with my friends. And, you know, he would be my best material. And to tell you the truth, somewhere in my heart, I knew that that was wrong. Because I'd never been taught to make fun of somebody that was sick. I'd never been taught that. And what happened on that family compound was this, that one of his sisters went to Al-Anon and she went to a couple of meetings and the kind people there suggested that she go to the meeting that was being held across the hall. And my one sister became a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and then my one sister-in-law became a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. A second sister joined. Third, these are all four sister-in-laws eventually in a very short period of time joined Alcoholics Anonymous and very quickly their spouses became members of Al-Anon. 
And so, because we all lived together uh, in a manner of speaking, and because I had the house that was closest to the pool, as they began to recover, they would come around a lot, and that's all they would talk about, really. I mean, they were so thrilled to have found the sobriety. That's all they talked about. They talked about alcoholism. They talked about it being in their family. They talked about alcoholism being a family disease and had been for generations. They talked about the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. They talked about the steps and the slogans. And they suggested to me that it might be something that I might want to look into, this fellowship called Al-Anon. Now, I'll tell you where I was at that point. I was done. I was done. I felt like I had, from the first six months of my marriage, I had been seeking help. And I was just tired of it. It was not about me, is what I thought. I was thrilled for them, but I wasn't going one more place for a solution for him. But I'll tell you what scared me. When they all got into this program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was pregnant with my seventh child. Oh, please. <laughs> Didn't you ever go overboard in anything that you ever did? There's a woman in my Al-Anon home group, she's from England, and she um, <clears throat> doesn't have any children, but as her husband progressed um, in his drinking, she started to plant rose bushes in her backyard, and as he progressed more and more, she asked her neighbor if she could use her backyard to plant more rose bushes. <laughs> she's got two yards full of rose bushes, and I remember the night when she was telling that story, I thought to myself, rose bushes, why didn't I think of rose bushes? How sane. So I'm pregnant with a seven child of mine, and I've always operated on what I call my eight-year plan, which means that Rick was four years older than I was, and women in America generally outlive men by about four years. So I just thought at the end of my life I'd have these little eight years of peace and quiet. You know, eight years where I didn't have to worry about what you were going to say, what I was going to say, eight, words, eight years of not always having, you know, to um, watch everything, to be so careful. And now they're telling me that alcoholism is a family disease. It's been in the family for years. And I'm thinking, there goes my eight-year plan. <laughs> so <clears throat> I knew a friend who had a friend who had a friend who was in Al-Anon. And I made that phone call, and she made that phone call. And what happened was I found a meeting. I found a meeting that had a beginner's group, and I went to it one, one evening in April 1982. And it was right before Easter Sunday. It was the Monday of that Easter week. And it was rainy and it was cold. And to this day, I am so grateful that so many men and women chose and continue to choose, no matter what the weather is, to show up at their home groups. Because <clears throat> I was told on that day that alcoholism was indeed a family disease, that I couldn't cure, that I couldn't control, and that I, couldn't, uh, that I didn't cause. And I had never thought that I had caused my husband's drinking, but I always believed that if I loved him enough that I would be able to cure it. I always believed that. And here these people are telling me really that my husband's recovery was not actually none of my business, that Al-Anon was a program for me no matter what anybody else in my life was doing. And I have never forgotten that. That, that I have been profoundly affected by this disease and that I need to pay attention to that. And that's what I heard those many years ago, and that's what I have never forgotten. And they told me eventually that unless I could see how sick I was myself and admit to it, I would never get better. And I can remember, you know, when I finally had a sponsor going home and calling her and saying, Patty, I don't feel particularly insane. I mean, I, I think really I'm fairly, I'm fairly good, you know. I mean, in, in the compound where I live, I mean, I think I'm one of the sanest people within a five-mile radius. And she said to me, well, think of this. Can you relate to being sick with anger, sick with fear, sick with anxiety? And that made sense to me. Because when I came in, I had no idea how angry I had become. I had no idea how resentful. I was. I was not in touch with those feelings at all until I continued to come and listen to men and women who are willing to honestly share themselves with me night after night, week after week, and who showed me that I had a choice. 
I had a choice about who I wanted to be in this world, and I had a choice about how I wanted to be. I can remember holding on to that slogan, let go and let God. I would go home and really, I always thought that I was the keeper of truth and justice in that relationship. I would go home and normally and I found it necessary always to correct his thinking and to let him know where he was wrong. You know, all that shaming, blaming, criticizing that was second nature to me. And these men and women told me, just let it go, let him go. Release him with love. That's, how I, that's what I was taught and when I came in, not detachment, we, we, they called it releasing with love, learning to love people with open hands. That's what these men and women told me. They told me I could use this phrase, you could be right. You could be right. That I didn't have to spend hours arguing and trying to get him to think right, you know. I could just simply say, you could be right. And that was the end of it. And what that allowed for me was hours of time on my hands to do, you know, to do things that were productive, for God's sakes. It just made a huge difference. Just those, those few, you know, just those few meetings in the very beginning just almost immediately helped me. I teach high school, and I only mention this because there is a little nun that used to teach next door to me, and she, in very little letters across her classroom, I teach high school, <clears throat> but in these little letters across the classroom, she has this quote, and I have no idea where this quote is from, but it says, <clears throat> our true work is to complete our birth, to fulfill our destiny, destiny, to live out our dreams that free our enormous souls from living a life too small. When I read that, I thought, that's what Al-Anon has given me. It has given me that freedom to free my enormous soul because I had spent years not thinking about what my relationship with God was, not wondering if I was responding to the grace of God in my life and my relationship with other people. I had spent my years hoping that he was going to be in a good mood. That's how I used to spend my days. So, you know, this program that has allowed me to see that I can be restored to sanity because of the disease of alcoholism, not because of my husband, because of the disease of alcoholism that has been in my family and, and for generations of this family. A disease that took from me my hopes and my dreams, my spontaneity, my humor, that's what that disease took from me. And ultimately it took what it always takes, and that was my dignity as a human being. And you, because of your willingness to share the grace of God in your own life and the program that you have found, you have restored me. You have set my feet back on that path to becoming the kind of woman that I believe that God invites me to be, the kind of woman that I believe that I was created to be, the kind of woman that I believe God has challenged me to be. My mother has a little prayer in her refrigerator that says, reach up as high as you can and God will reach down the rest of the way. And that's what you have shown me, that if I am willing to give myself to this program, to do what it is that you tell me to do, to practice these principles in my affairs, I can continue that journey to become and to live out my destiny, to fulfill those dreams that God always has had for me and for my children. Nothing really changed for me until I got a sponsor and until I did a fourth step. Because for years I'd been asking the wrong questions. I'd been asking what's wrong with him. And never once did I take a look at what was wrong with me. In Al-Anon we talk about the four M's. Manipulating, managing, mothering, and martyrdom. And I had to take a look at those four M's in my life. You want to talk about weapons of mass destruction? <laughs> I had to take a look. <clears throat> I had to take a look and be responsible for my arsenal of weapons of mass destruction, those weapons that destroy love and respect in a marriage. And I had to be willing to change. I had to see them and I had to be willing to change. My sponsor was so helpful because it was in the fifth step that I learned to forgive myself. It was, it was where I learned to forgive myself. It was where I began to love myself. And I am just one who believes that until I love myself, and only when I love myself, that's, will I ever be able to teach other people how to treat me. 
You know, there is um, no x-ray for my disease. I mean, we get missed. We get missed a lot. And I know one of the reasons I got missed so much is because I was so good at looking good. I was so good at making it seem like everything was just okay. One of my uh, sister-in-laws in AA always says that when she goes to an AA conference, she always goes to the Al-Anon speaker. And I said, well, that's nice. And she said, oh, yes, it makes me very grateful I drank. <laughs> but I know, I mean, I know how we, you know, I know what happens to us. We, without recovery, I know what would happen to me. I would go through the rest of my life blaming someone else, being bitter, and ultimately ending up very, very lonely because that's what happens, never taking responsibility for who I am. When I came into Al-Anon, this concept of an anonymity, you know the way it was explained to me by someone uh, that had many, many years in the program? They said to me, anonymity really means that we are all equals, that the scepter of the prince and the staff of the beggar are left at the door, and when we come in, we are all equals. That sense of humility has really, was really, was one that you had when I first came in that has always been very, very attractive to me. That idea of recognizing really who I am and humbly asking God to remove those defects of character. And we all do it together. I go to meetings with men and women of great courage and great faith and tremendous grace in their lives. And some of them have lived with heart-rendering, just heart-rendering situations. When I was told to make a list of people that I had harmed, I knew that my children had to be on that list in addition to others. My husband and I loved our children, but my kids had been hurt because I was always, always living in the past, nursing wounds that had happened, always gathering evidence, you know, to build a case against him, or I was way in the future, terrified of what was going to happen next. I was never in the present for my kids. So a lot of amends had to be made. You were the ones that told me the most powerful amends I could make for my children was to give them a healthy parent. That what I could really do for my children was to continue with my program. Give them a healthy parent, Kathy. Get well. Just keep coming back. Keep coming back. Practice these principles. And that was the most powerful thing that I could do for my kids because my kids were pretty little. And that's what you've taught me. And I knew one day I would have to make amends to my husband for all those things that I had done. Really, for all the ways that I had treated him. I had really, my way is not, as I said, to nag or to scream. My way is to ignore. Our reading today talks about the difference between building walls and building boundaries. I didn't know how to, anything about boundaries, but walls, I knew about walls. I just ignored him pretty much. I erased him as a human being. What an awful thing to do to a, to a human being. I erased him as a human being. I had to make amends for that. I had to change my ways. I had to change my way of being his wife. And I tried as best I could. And I went to him and I made him my amends. But then I had to continue with this program. I wasn't in Al-Anon very long at all. My husband had this hobby in addition to hunting fox and raising bees. He also had this hobby of flying, uh, building uh, what's called a gyrocopter. Um, and it's really just like a lawn chair with a, um, <laughs> blades and a little engine in the back. It's very dangerous, which of course he and all my children, you know, if it, if it can't kill you or maim you, they're not interested in it. And, but he used to go off and fly in this gyrocopter all the time. And how I used to resent it. I used to resent it. But you are the ones who used to say, Kathy, if it brings him any peace, why would you want to take it away from him? He's not a bad man. He's a sick man. If he likes it, let him do it. And it changed my whole attitude about it and about him. So this one Memorial Day weekend as he was going off to fly, it's a gorgeous day, I said to him, Rick, you have a beautiful day. Have a ball. And those are the last words I ever spoke to my husband. Two hours later, I was coming up that driveway with a station wagon full of kids, and I noticed in my rearview mirror the police. And when I pulled over to the house and the kids started piling out of the car, one of the policemen said, why don't you send them into the house? And it was almost as though I knew 
and I could have said the words with him, Mrs. Heakin, your husband has crashed and died. And moments after they had said this, and I looked in that little dining room window, and I could see those little kids, you know, with their big eyes. His mother, who was the only one of his parents still living, just happened up the driveway. She parked her car in front of her house, and as she walked over, one of them ran over to give her the news that her son, her oldest boy, and I do believe her most beloved child, had died. And when she made her way to me with her arms open, as she held me in her arms, she said to me, thank God he's out of his pain. And I have never forgotten those words because <clears throat> I don't know why my husband's four sisters and now one brother have all found Alcoholics Anonymous. My husband tried it. It scared him to death. It scared him to death. He said, I, I just can't believe we're supposed to be that happy. I've had too much of a Jesuit education to believe that we're supposed to be that happy. But I know this. I know today the peace and the serenity that eluded him in his life, he has now. Because I believe that a compassionate and a merciful God holds him in his arms. And that's enough for me. I don't understand why some people make it and some people don't, but I've been told by my sponsor that that's just the mystery of the way God works. And I know a priest that says the opposite of faith is not disbelief. The opposite of faith is anxiety. And so I choose to live today with a belief that my husband is exactly where he's supposed to be today. <clears throat> I'm going to try to be quick, although I've never really known how to be quick in my whole life, but <clears throat> I know this, <clears throat> that those seven children, when Rick died, our oldest was only 14 years old. So I had seven kids under the age of 14. <clears throat> I was at a meeting not so long ago with parents, just parents. Of, it was an Al-Anon group for parents. One of the mothers said, you know, my husband and I have made a decision not to name any of our children by name. And I thought, well, I like that. I like that idea of not, you know, getting up here and naming my kids. But in a general way, I will just say this. My kids are really intense. Um, <clears throat> they're just intense. And <clears throat> when Rick died, you know, I'm watching this thing in Iraq right now. I mean, I've got a son over in Egypt who's with a peacekeeping force. I do have a nephew in Baghdad. But I'm watching this thing over in Iraq and and Afghanistan before that. And it just seems to me that when there's a power vacuum, everything just kind of breaks loose. So when Rick was gone, these seven kids, all of a sudden, it was like I was living with the Taliban. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, they were just like, I mean, things happened. And um, I don't know, some of them drink, and, I don't, and, and some of them don't, but most of them do. Most of them do, and I have a sponsor that says some very good things to me. She says, if you are your children's higher power, they'll never find their higher power on their own. She also says this weekly to me. Kathy, why don't you let God sort that out? Why don't you let God sort that out? I have no business saying which one of my children is alcoholic or not. My children love to know who it is. I mean, <laughs> when one of them gets me alone, they'll say, so mom, who do you think's the alcoholic of all of us kids? And whoever the kid is who asks me, I always say, I think it's you. <laughs> anyway, so I got these kids and, you know, they're kind of wild and, you know, being a single parent is it's not easy. I, one time I took him to a counselor for grief, and he, I said to him, you know, I'm having a hard time trying to keep track of all these kids, much less trying to mother them. And he said, oh, you can't possibly parent them adequately. I said, I can't? He said, oh, no, you're understaffed. <laughs> and, you know, it was the greatest thing anybody said to me because it was almost like, oh, yeah, well, I, all I can do is the best I can do. And that's what I believe. All I can do is the best I can do. There's a woman that I know in AA who runs a rehab for teenagers. And if you have teenagers, as I have had, teenage behavior looks an awful lot to me like alcoholic behavior. <laughs> she used to say to me, um, 
You know, really, if you're trying to get them sober for the rest of their lives, you're, you're fighting a losing cause. Just take small actions. Just take small actions. Interrupt their drinking. Hope they stay al alive long enough to get into AA, and that's probably the best that you can do. Such a good thing for me, because all these kids of mine, those that had run into trouble with drinking with the law, I just always looked at it as taking those small actions, taking those small actions and letting go of the results. And it has brought me, a tr as a single parent, it has brought me a tremendous amount of peace in my life. Because one day at a time, all I can do is what I can do. But I know that I'm not doing it alone, because I believe in a God who would never have taken their father from me without giving me a tremendous amount of people in this program and out of this program that have helped me raise these children to the best of my ability. I know that. I have my brother's love, of course, telling stories about my crazy kids. My one brother has a friend who coached one of my boys, basketball. And uh, this particular son of mine, whenever they were losing a basketball game, um, he was also a big football player, but when he was playing basketball, whenever they were losing a basketball game and they would all huddle up as a team, my one son would always get in the huddle and say to this coach, you want me to go in there and hurt somebody? <laughs> they love that story. <clears throat> <clears throat> when I was a kid, I didn't get in trouble if what my kids did was funny. I mean, when I was a kid, when I did stuff to get in trouble, if it was funny, my parents loved it. They, they, they just would say, that teacher has no sense of humor. That's a funny thing you did. That's a funny thing you did. I feel the same way about my kids. It's a terrible way to parent, but really, I can't help it. My mother today, of course, says, what your kids need is a crack in the head. You want me to come over, I'll give them a crack in the head. She thinks everything, including alcoholism, is cured by a crack in the head. But <laughs> that's my mother. She's also the one that says to me, why do you keep going to Al-Anon? Rick is dead. I say, Mom, I keep going because I'm not. So, so I do the best I can. That's all I know. My kids get in trouble, and some of it's minor stuff. Some of it's been a little larger stuff. Some of it's been a little larger stuff. But I show up. I, I never get lawyers for them, but I always go to court with them. And, you know, always say, how can I be of service? You know, what can I do here? How can I help you? I co always cooperate, cooperate a lot. As a matter of fact, interestingly, one of the referees for juvenile court um, adopted a baby. She sent me an invitation to the shower. And everybody, all their women friends were like, well, I work with her. I work, how do you know her? How do you know her? And then they'd say to me, how do you know her? And I'd say, we, professional basis. <laughs> <clears throat> One time, uh, uh, the principal of this grade school where some of the kids went called me because one of the boys uh, was getting in a lot of trouble at school. And so... Uh, all the teachers wanted to meet with me and with him. So, you know, I went down early because I have to teach myself at a, at a high school down the street. But I went down there, and uh, here is this poor little kid of mine. I mean, he was like at the time in the third grade. And he's just sitting around this table with all these teachers and the principal. And one by one, the teachers are, you know, listing their complaints. And the one teacher says, when anyone in the classroom sneezes, he falls out of his desk. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's pretty funny. <clears throat> but I don't say that. I'm like, no. Oh. This other teacher says, when I'm lecturing, he taps on his desk with a pencil just to annoy me. You know, and I want to say, lady, get a life. I mean, come on. But I don't say that. So they're all going around the room. And, and the more they talk, it's like he's shrinking in his chair. And I'm getting mad, to tell you the truth. Because as a teacher, I'll tell you this. Sometimes it isn't your kids. Sometimes it's the teacher. I mean, really. Sometimes it's the teacher. And... Um, so the principal, even at this point, is like, well, you know, maybe this has gone on long enough. I know you got to get uh, over to uh, where you teach, so, you know, we'll call it a day, and uh, I'm sure you'll, your son will shape up. So I said, okay. So I took this kid of mine, and I said, you come out to the car with me. So I took him out to the car in front of this little grade school, and I said to him, you listen to me, Nick. You are a great kid. I know you can be a pain in the neck, but 
your fabric, there isn't a thing wrong with the fabric of who you are. You are a great kid. Now you go back in there, Nick, and you do the best you can today, but you believe me when I say this. I am proud of you, and your father is proud of you too. And don't you, you just keep your chin up, Nick. You just keep your chin up. The poor kid, you know, he's got these tears running down his face, and he looks up at me and he goes, I'm Daniel. <laughs> Whatever. <clears throat> anyway. Anyway. So, those are a little lighthearted stories. There have been some more difficult ones, too. The other thing about alcoholism is this, <clears throat> that I have found, is that we talk a lot about the resentment, we talk a lot about anger, we talk a lot about a lot of things, but the one thing that really strikes me mostly about this disease is the great grief that's associated with it. And, um, and that's just something I just, I don't know how to get around. Because if you, like me, have had a child who um, has really gotten into a lot of trouble with the drinking, you know what grief that is. My sponsor always says to me, there is no inoculation for the pain of alcoholism. There's no inoculation for the pain of alcoholism. And I have found that to be true. There is no inoculation for the kind of pain that I have felt on two occasions when my sons have been brought before me in shackles and handcuffs. That is hard. It's just hard. But the beauty is that I've never had to walk through that alone. The beauty is, is that I have a tremendous network of men and women who are with me, who I can call, and the God of my understanding, who has never left me in this situation by myself. I believe in the grace of God. There is nothing quite like picking up that phone at 1 o'clock in the morning and having that officer say, Mrs. Heakin, I'm at University Hospital. We have your son. That's a difficult. It is difficult. It's also difficult when you're not quite sure where your children are. But I go to meetings and sponsor women who have lost children to suicide as a result of this disease, who have lost children to automobile accidents, and this darling woman friend of mine who I sponsor who two years ago, her son was murdered. And they show up, they show up at meetings, shoulder to shoulder we sit, and they come and they share their experience and their strength and their hope, nightly and weekly. And I know that I will never, no matter what may happen to any one of my beloved children, I know that I will never be alone and I do not have to face any of that by myself. All this attention on these boys and last September, my darling, overachieving daughter calls me to tell me she doesn't think that she can drink anymore. It's like, what? <laughs> we haven't even been paying any attention to you. What? <laughs> I mean, up to this point, we've had some of our vacations. You know, our vacations are planned around rehabs for these lousy boys. <laughs> This kid's my right-hand man. I mean, you know, she helped me raise these kids. I, I was stunned. But I'll tell you what, if you're like me and you go to enough conventions and you hear enough speakers and it's like, I'm in, you know, I'm in, my husband's in, all my children, children are in, we spend our vacations at Recovery World. I mean, <laughs> what? So now, I mean, I got years in and just now. I have two boys who've been in AA. They're not in anymore. They think that uh, they were brainwashed. I just say to them, you could be right. <laughs> but I got this daughter in Chicago, gives me a call, says, what do I do? I said, well, I bet there's AA in Chicago. You can call them or I can call somebody who's, you know, knows somebody who knows somebody. That's what I did. I called this friend of mine. He got a name of a man in, Ch in Chicago. The man called, you know, gave him get called me, get phone number, work number, fax number, cell phone number. I called, gave her the information, which is what you taught me to do. I gave her that information, let it go, Pfft, have nothing to do with it whatsoever, and that little dear has been sober since September. Pfft. How does that work? How does that work? So just trying to wind this up quickly, I will say this. My children, the gift of my children has been this. They have kept me on my knees. They have kept me on my knees, and they've kept me extremely humble. I have a son right now who is struggling terribly. And on Tuesday when I was driving to my home group, I said to this woman that I'm tr driving with, if I could open my chest and pull out my heart, I'd want to cover it with salve because my heart is breaking for this kid.
My heart is breaking for this kid. But he has been around, and he knows the solution. And my job is to practice principles in my life as best as I can. I know that. I will not get that child sober. But somebody in this room might. Somebody in this room might. My message is to live a life that I see fit and to practice the principles in my affairs. But the grief... um, The grief, I think, uh, needs to be addressed. You don't have to do it alone. You don't have to do it alone. I need to practice that tenth step. I need to, on a daily basis, pay close attention to the kind of woman that I am each day. Am I that woman that I believe God wants me to be, or am I not? I have got to carve out of my day time for prayer and meditation. When those kids were little, I joined a Y, and I would swim at 5.15 every morning, and that's the best that I could do because it was quiet. I still do that today, but in addition to that, I have the opportunity, because most of those kids are gone, to really find some quality time for prayer and meditation. For me, it is essential. In Celtic spirituality, they talk about thin moments, And thin moments are those moments where that line between the divine and the real, very, very thin. I find my thin moments in meetings where men and women share their faith with me, their faith in a program, their faith in the God of their understanding. Those are my thin moments. When one of my kids graduated from St. Louis University, the woman that gave the um, commencement address was talking about her six-year-old child who had just learned the Lord's Prayer. And he was so excited to, to, to give it to her. And finally she said, okay, 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 recite it. And her little six-year-old son stood in front of her and said, Our Father who art in heaven, how'd you know my name? <laughs> That's what I have found in Al-Anon. That is the gift that you have given me. You have given me a God who knows my name. You have given me a God who has issued to me an invitation into an intimate relationship. And the way that I got that invitation was through the disease of alcoholism. And I have no trouble with that because I believe that we, are all, we all get that invitation. I know how I got mine, and the invitation and finding it has been enough for me. So I don't spend much time looking back and saying, why this, why that, what if, what if. I know where I am today. I'm surrounded by men and women that I love and who love me. I'm in an intimate relationship with the God of my understanding who never, ever leaves me alone, who never will either shield me from suffering, who either will shield me for suffering, from suffering or will give me the courage to meet it one day at a time, a God who will be able to bring peace out of chaos, who will bring hope out of despair. I believe in that God, and I found that God through, through the program of Al-Anon and through the disease, actually, of alcoholism, and for that I'm very, very grateful. I go on a silent retreat um, once a year, and not so long ago I took my sponsor with me, and tell you the truth, I've never talked more in my whole life is when she accompanied me. But while we were there, there was this little old priest who told a story about Buddhist monks in a monastery somewhere deep in Nepal, and they had this one beautiful cup that they used in all their ceremonies, and it was very precious to them. And one of them, as he was getting it down off the shelf, dropped it, and it broke into pieces. And they were distraught, these Buddhist monks, as distraught as you can be if you're a Buddhist monk. And they picked up the pieces, they gathered up the pieces, and they took them to the artesian of the village because they didn't know what else to do. They couldn't on their own get them to fit back together and stay. So the artesian of the village, who was a very wise man, took gold and melted it. And he welded all those pieces back together until that cup was more precious than it had ever been. And when I heard that story, I thought to myself, that's what Al-Anon has done for me. I came to you broken and in pieces, and you have welded me back together with the gold of your love and your understanding and your willingness to be there. And through you and through the grace of a gracious and loving God, I am more precious today than I have ever felt before. And for that, I'm truly grateful. Thank you.